welcome everyone and thank you for coming today and for those of you who came early, thank you for waiting till 12.30. Um, uh, so I am the director of the Calvary Center for Jewish Studies here at Stanford, uh, Charlotte Lisheva from Robert. Um, and we are very happy to host this event today, uh, the presentation by Professor Samuel Castle from Trinity College, where he is the Charles Northern Professor of History. He will be introduced by Shana Penn. So allow me just to say two brief words, uh, well, a couple more, uh, of uh, brief uh, welcome introduction. We are very, the Tommy Center is very grateful to the Tommy Foundation for Jewish Life and Culture for sponsoring today's event. Um, <coughs> both the main people um, of, for the foundation and for sponsoring this event are here today <coughs> with us. Our very own Ted Talby, <coughs> sorry, who is the uh, founder of the Talby Foundation. He doesn't need to, most of us, to many of us, to all of us, he doesn't really need introduction because Ted's generosity has touched so many of our lives, especially here at, St at Stanford. So we're grateful that you could come. And Shana Penn is the uh, executive director of the uh, Taubi Foundation. Uh, most of you in the room know Shana as the executive director of the Taubi Foundation. Uh, for Jewish life and culture, but some of you may not know that she is a uh, notable historian of Jewish life in Poland, in, in contemporary Poland herself, an award-winning author um, about the women, about women's participation in the Solidarity Movement, uh, Solidarity Secret, a very nice, um, very beautifully written book, highly recommended. Uh, so um, I'm very happy that you can introduce our speaker today. So with this, <coughs> allow me to welcome Shana, who will introduce Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I, before I introduce Sam, I want to make an announcement and then another introduction. Uh, the Toby Foundation um, and the Polish Foreign Ministry are co-supporting a new uh, study program, the second year of a study pro summer study program in Poland for undergraduate and graduate students from across the United States who are of Polish or uh, Polish Jewish descent. And we are going to be posting the two study tours, information about the two study tours around the campus. If you have any questions, please talk to our staff, Ola Marku, who's, um, who's helping to coordinate the program. It, uh, this, the two 10-day uh, study tours cover all expenses except for the international um, aircraft. I'd also like to welcome Lisa Kassa, who is the director of Trinity College Hillel, and it is her first time here in the Bay Area. <laughs> She and Sam are, 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 are veritable refugees from the Siberian winter of Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to welcome Sam back to the Bay Area and to Stanford. Uh, Sam Cassell directs Jewish, the Jewish Studies program at Trinity College. He's taught courses in Jewish history at Harvard, Princeton, and Wesleyan, as well as at universities in Tel Aviv and Moscow. From 2010 to 2013, he served as chair of the Holocaust Division of the Association of Jewish Studies. Dr. Cassell is co-curator of the 19th century and interwar galleries of the new Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews for exhibition. Uh, Sam is the author of Who Will Write Our History, Emanuel Ringelblum, and the Oinek Shabbos Archive. It was published in 2007 by uh, Indiana University Press. Is it is the winner of the Orvis Prize of, Ameri of the American Association for Advancement of Slavic Studies and a finalist for the 2008 National Jewish Book Award. Uh, it has appeared already in German, French, Italian, Portuguese, Dutch, Swedish, Hebrew, and Polish. The New <coughs> Republic said that this is the penultimate book about the historiography of 
uh, the Polish jury, and, and we all strongly recommend it. It is, um, the book is now set to be adapted for the screen by director Roberta Grossman and executive producer Nancy Spielberg. Grossman's, one of Grossman's last well-known films is Habana Gila. None of her films was on Hannah Senesh. Uh, Sam is also in the process of completing a highly anticipated book called Listen and Believe, the Ghetto Reportage of Peretz Opochinski and Josef Zokovic. And this will be released by this year by Yale University Press. Wonderful. On February 16th of this year, Sam was honored in Warsaw, Poland for his service to Polish culture by the Polish Minister of Culture and National Heritage, Margarzata Omilanowska, um, who presented the Culture Medal, Medal to Sam in a special ceremony. And um, I'm, always, um, I'm always very honored and delighted to welcome Sam whenever he speaks, because he was my, my freshman college professor at mm -hmm. Sandy College. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll never forget, in that first Iberian winter, it was an ice storm in Hartford, and Sam said, I'm getting out of here, and he went to Warsaw to do research on Emmanuel Ringelblum. And here we are today. <laughs> Welcome, Sam. <laughs> okay, thank you uh, for inviting me. Thanks to the Toby Foundation. Thanks to the Jewish Studies Program at Stanford. And uh, it's so great uh, to be here. Uh, and uh, I've uh, really uh, come to appreciate uh, this wonderful uh, climate that you have and the beautiful <laughs> place that you live in. Uh, working on the Museum of Polish Jewish History, for me, has been a formative experience. I came to the museum in 2000. 7, 2006, and I worked on two galleries uh, covering the period from 1860 to 1939. And I began to see the enormous difference between writing about history and showing history for the public. When you write about history, and especially on such a fraught issue as Polish Jewry and Polish-Jewish relations, you're always thinking about nuance, about the shades of gray, about context. The thing you want to avoid, most of all, is oversimplification, because God knows so many people do it. And working on a museum, it doesn't work that way. You still have to be nuanced. You still have to uh, tell the truth. But you have to eliminate 99% of what you know. And with that remaining 1%, you have to tell a compelling narrative. And uh, this I learned, hopefully, thanks to the tutelage of the brilliant Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimler, uh, who was instrumental in, uh, in uh, planning the, the uh, museum, which overcame so many obstacles. And thanks to the support of the Polish government, the city of Warsaw, uh, donors such as Tad Toby, uh, Sigmund Rolat, and many others, the museum finally overcame all the hurdles, all the landmarks, and it now is attracting tens of thousands of visitors in Warsaw. Barbara told me right from the beginning that this would be a very different kind of museum. It would have very few artifacts, hardly any artifacts. The museum would engage the visitor through different layers of presentation. There would be timelines, there would be visual projections, interactive displays. The museum would not be about the Jews and the Jews' lives in Poland, but about Polish Jews. So interwoven with Poland and with the Polish land that no history of Poland could be told without reference to the Jews. And no history of the Jews could be told without reference to Poland. As Professor Moshe Rosman wrote about this museum, distinctively Polish, categorically Jewish. And though this has been said many times, it's worth repeating. This is a museum about life, not about death. 
Uh, it's about 1,000 years of Polish Jewish history. There are eight galleries. One is about the Holocaust, the seventh gallery, which means that we have an eighth gallery in and of itself a statement reminding us that Jewish life in Poland did not end with World War II. In some form, it continues to the present day. When we say that no history of the Jews can be told without reference to Poland, all we have to do is look at sheer numbers. In 1500, there were perhaps 30,000 Jews tops on the lands that would become the Polish Commonwealth, which of course is much bigger than Poland now. Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, and so on. By 1765, that number had increased to 765,000. By 1900, out of those same lands, 8 million. If you're an Ashkenazi Jew, the chances are 9 in 10 that your ancestors lived on the lands of the old commonwealth. In 1650, Ashkenazi Jewry was only 50% of the Jewish people. By 1939, Ashkenazi Jewry was 90% of the Jewish people. And it was the descendants of Polish Jews that largely populated Hungary, and Bessarabia, and Bukadina, and all of the uh, very uh, cultured uh, superior Yekis who will always remind you that German Jews were, were of course, much superior to the Ostjuden, the chances were that their grandparents probably came from Poland. So what explained this rise of Polish Jewry from a marginal to a central community? It's a subject of, hot, of debate, especially on the issue of demographics. But there's no denying some critical reasons why the Polish Commonwealth became the demographic and cultural hub of Ashkenazi Jewry. The symbiosis with the Polish nobility. They needed us, and they wanted us to come there to develop the economy. <coughs> the relative autonomy given us by the Poles, exemplified in the Council of the Four Lands. The rise of the shtetl as a new form of Jewish settlement, a private company town of the nobility, which didn't exist in Babylonia, Spain, or Germany. <coughs> the name Polin, the name of the museum, reminds the visitor of the many tales of origin that Polish Jews like to tell about what happened when they got to Poland. One tale was that the Jews came to the Polish lands and emblazoned on the bark of the trees there were the Hebrew letters, Polin, here you will rest. And this is what, this is the name of the museum. The tales of origin also show a deep Jewish love of the Polish landscape. When Shinlam Schneider, a Yiddish writer, wrote his autobiography, Growing Up in Kazimierz Dolny, a little town on the Vistula, he entitled that autobiography, Ben when the Vistula spoke Yiddish. There was a Yiddish poet called Arya Shemri, who wrote a poem, and the refrain was, and of course, he's seeing the Bug and the Vistula and the Nara as Jewish rivers. He says, Babaisel Bugu Nares, Ashacharis in the Osses, Aminchu Namayev in Klingen Funikosses. On the banks of the Vistula, the Bug, and the Nara, you could see the words of the morning prayers and the glistening dew. And in the afternoon, the sighs that cut the grain tap out a Mincha and the Maira, the evening prayers. So all this reminds us that for a very long time the Jews saw Poland as home. Poland was not just a cemetery, not just a site on the march of the living, but Poland was home. And the building itself, as you've probably heard many times by now, reminds us of this. It is full of light. It is situated in the heart of what used to be bustling Jewish Warsaw. The mezuzah on the building is taken from the rubble of what used to be the Warsaw Ghetto. <clears throat> now, a major challenge in planning this museum was to tell a narrative that would appeal to highly different audiences. One of the most important audiences that we have to keep in mind were Polish high school students. On their senior class trip to Warsaw, 
We believe that this museum would tell them about their country as it really was. That their country was not always 98% Polish or 98% Catholic. That the provincial towns where they were living today were once upon a time more than half uh, Jewish. Uh, and that this is part of their heritage. For American Jews, and especially for American Jewish students who are going to come to Poland and look at this museum, one thing that I hope they'll get out of this museum is a sense of Jewish peoplehood. That the Jews are not just a religion, not just the faith, not just uh, involved in a common spiritual quest. This is a museum about a Jewish nation, about a Jewish folk that grew up and developed on the Polish lands. And we believe that this museum, and, and we hope that this museum will be a game changer in Polish-Jewish relations. We went to the soft opening, the opening of the building in April 2013, which coincided with the 70th anniversary of the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto. The museum had 15,000 visitors in only two days. There were kids from all over Warsaw passing out paper, uh, yellow daffodils with the words Pamiętaj, remember. The Israel Philharmonic came with uh, Zubin Meka. Uh, Simcha Rotem, a last surviving fighter from the Warsaw Ghetto up, uh, uprising, was given a decoration by the Polish uh, president. And then in October of this past year, we had the formal opening of the museum. A great speech by the President of Israel, by the President of Poland. But one of the things that really impressed me was the fact that down the main thoroughfare of Warsaw, you had Polish and Israeli flags side by side. It's something you probably couldn't see today in Dublin or London or even in San Francisco probably. Uh, but we saw it in Poland. And of course there was this wonderful talk by the Polish Minister of Culture who looked forward to this museum becoming a safe place. A safe place of Polish-Jewish dialogue, a safe place of Polish-Jewish understanding. The planning of the museum, as I said, has to be very layered. We know that the average visitor from the first gallery, the medieval forest, to the gift shop will probably spend about two hours. And so there's a basic two-hour trip for a casual visitor. But we're also hoping that visitors will linger, they'll tarry, they'll return, and they'll examine the second and the third levels of the exhibits. And the fundamental modus operandi of the museum, in exhibit after exhibit, is this theme of relationality and context. So, for example, one of the most gorgeous exhibits in the museum is the reconstruction of a synagogue roof based on the old synagogue of uh, Gvozhets. And, and this is absolutely gorgeous. And there's a story how this was done. And when people look at that synagogue roof, they will ask themselves, if the Jews in this out-of-the-way shtetl felt so fearful, so impoverished, so persecuted, then where did they get the wherewithal and the self-confidence to build such a gorgeous synagogue? Uh, and that the exhibits about the shtetl in early modern Poland also show us that while on the one hand the shtetl was heavily Jewish, on the other hand, they were in an ongoing relationship with non-Jews. The exhibit includes a Catholic church, which every shtetl had. And the exhibit includes a tavern, where Jews and Polish peasants got together and spoke more than anywhere else. The museum has a corridor of fire that evokes the terrible Chmelnitsky massacres and the Swedish invasions of the 17th century, where tens of thousands of Jews were killed and which Jews remember to this day. But <coughs> on the other side of that corridor, as you enter the 18th century into the country, you see a great revival of Jewish life. 
more new shtetls were created in the 18th century than any other time. Jewish life was not set back by this terrible disaster of 1648 to 1660. Another major rule of the museum is no backshadowing. All quotes and all texts that we use, quotes and texts that we use in the interwar exhibit, are contemporaneous. So we use no texts that were written after 1939. We avoid looking at this interwar period through the prism of the Holocaust. Now, if some of you are specialists or even uh, interested in Polish Jewish history, you can look at the books that have come out on the, book, on the Jews of interwar Poland. Look at some of the titles on the edge of destruction by Celia Stepnitska Heller, No Way Out by Emanuel Meltzer, both very good books. In, uh, in uh, Yiddish, Jacob Leszczynski, Auf den Rand von Obgrund, On the Edge of the Abyss. Those titles kind of tell you something, right? And it's that attitude that we try to avoid. And so the, the first theme of our exhibit, the iconic space which will frame the entire interwar exhibit, is called the Jewish street, the Yiddish Gas. And we talk about the 3.3 million Jews in the Second Polish Republic that were 10% of the population in a country where only 60% of the people were ethnically Polish. And there's a question that we had to wrestle with, and we decided that it's a question that we would leave it for the visitor to judge on his own. Was the glass half full or half empty, or both? Were the Jews in the Second Polish Republic on the edge of destruction, as some historians claim? Or was it also and or a period of great cultural creativity and social dynamism, despite economic hardship and despite the rising anti-Semitism of the 1930s? So visitors can decide for themselves as they go through four major thematic areas, politics, and culture on the street level, and then upstairs in the shape of a U of a U of everyday life and uh, growing up. Now, I must admit that personally, this was not an easy uh, thing for me to do because uh, I didn't want to be seen as a wimp, as an apologist. I didn't want to be seen as someone who soft pedaled of uh, the uh, truth of what Jews had to go through in Poland, especially in the, in the, the 1930s. Uh, and at the same time, I didn't want to make it just a black and white story, that there were a lot of nuances here, that while Jews in Poland had a very hard time during this period, it, they also had periods of great optimism and, and, and of great cultural resilience and vitality, and trying to show both simultaneously. Yad Vashem called Barbara and me a couple of years ago and said, we want to see this interwar exhibit. We want to check it out. Yad Vashem was very suspicious that anybody would kind of intrude on their turf and, and do things that they thought only they should be doing. So with great trepidation, we went to Israel, they saw the exhibit, and they decided it wasn't bad. They kind of liked it. Uh, are we too easy on Polish anti-Semitism? I don't know. Yad Vashem said we were okay. There have been some Polish historians who say, you know what, you were, you were too easy. You should have told a much tougher story. But there are also people who complain, another Polish reviewer, that we made things worse than they really were. The Jewish street, or the Yiddish Agas, really means in Yiddish the Jewish world, this diverse, nationally conscious world of Jewish Poland. And uh, this image reminds us that in 1939, uh, one in four Polish Jews lived in the five biggest cities. And that it was the big cities with their theaters, newspapers, writers, self-help organizations that were transforming Polish Jewish life. 
And so this is an exhibit about how Poland in the 20s and 30s, and keep in mind, of all the exhibits in the gallery, all the eight galleries, this is the shortest in terms of time. It's only 20 years. And a theme that we show in, in this gallery is interwar Poland as a living laboratory for experiments in modern Jewish life. A laboratory of experiments cut short by the war. So how these experiments turned out, we never will know. And we see beginnings. We don't see final results. We see journeys. We don't see final destinations. And if you go down the street, and if you look down the street, and of course there are many doors where you can explore the different exhibits, at the very end, you see people pointing up to the sky. And that's the beginning of the next gallery. That's September 1st, 1939, the first German air raid on, on oh, 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 Warsaw. And that's when the exhibit ends. It ends suddenly. It, 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 it ends with finality. And then we're into the Holocaust. The exhibit shows the striking diversity of Polish Jewry. Oh, alongside political and ideological infighting, we also see that these Jews were ordinary people who went to dance halls as well as synagogues, listened to jazz, played soccer, read world literature in either Polish or Yiddish translation. Polish Jews did not want to live in a cultural ghetto. In Jewish libraries in interwar Poland, even for books that were checked out in Yiddish, most of those books were by non-Jewish authors. Zola, Roman Rolon, Komisman in Yiddish translation. And one of the most popular songs of interwar Poland was written by Mordechai Gebirtik, great songwriter killed in 1942, and it's about an Orthodox girl who's trying to get her chniok of a boyfriend to learn how to dance. And he won't do it. And she says, Means I don't care if you're a Bundes, I don't care if you're a Zionist, the time will come when even the members of the Aguda, the religious Orthodox, are going to learn how to step out and do the tango and the charleston. And this is the kind of an atmosphere that we were trying to, uh, to uh, convey. We were trying to show that Polish Jews were part of a changing world. By the way, my own uh, grandmother in this little shtetl near Vilna had a restaurant. And Saturday nights, she turned it into a movie theater. And she'd show films that were a year or two old. And in the Evo, I found the Shtetl newspaper, the ad she would put in for King Kong, Kung Zet, that's Fonsik Meta the Gamal, that comes to a 20 meter high eight. Captain's courageous. And my mother remembered that in the summer of 1939, they were told that the next year, they probably would get a Tishik Macha from Oz, the Wiz Wizard of Oz, or they would get a Vekmit and Dick gone with the wind. But of course, then the war started, and none of that happened. And even in this remote shell, we see how young people rejected the world of their parents and found a substitute family and a substitute home in the youth movements that challenged age-old uh, traditions. And even in this remote shell where my mother came from, the youth movements had a Miss Glebuk contest. And there was a picture of the winning Miss Glebuk with a big sash uh, saying Miss Glebuk in the Yiddish. What the newspaper didn't say was that there was a fist fight uh, after the winner was judged to be Miss Sozo, who came from Hashomer Hatzair, and the tar said she gave a miasty and Malka, she was ugly, and the only reason she won was because of political correctness. <laughs> now, at the same time, we're careful not to carry the story of modernization and secularization too far. We also show the yeshiva students of Kletz in Mir. We show the Bubba for Hasidi. We show the Chofetz Chaim. And we remind you that Polish Jewry in the Second Republic was not a given. 
It was a work in progress. There were different Jewish tribes, the Litvaks, the Jews of Central Poland, the Galicianas, different cultures, different backgrounds, all being thrown together. And it was not so easy for them to get along in this new common melting pot that was called Poland. But slowly, they did become Polish Jews. <coughs> The gallery begins with a transitional space that shows the devastation of World War I and its aftermath. For Poland, the war lasted from 1914 to 1921, and the Polish state was born in devastation, ruin, and bloodshed, with the Poles fighting along all of their borders. And in the process, it was easy for them to accuse the Jews of siding with Poland's enemies, and that's indeed what happened. Now, Jews regarded the rebirth of Poland with a mixture of hope and a dread. Hope that Poland would indeed live up to its self-proclaimed liberal and democratic traditions, and indeed Jews enjoyed the right to vote and civil liberties. Also, a, a dread, dread of Polish anti-Semitism, reinforced by a wave of anti-Jewish violence between 1918 and 1921. Pogroms in Vilna and Lvov, a massacre of Jewish community leaders in uh, Pinsk. While the Polish pogroms did not compare to the Ukrainian pogroms, they still came as a terrible shock. And this is the burial of some of the victims of the Kolbushova po uh, pogrom in 1918. Uh, and this is Yablona were Jewish soldiers fighting for Polish uh, uh, independence and fighting the Red Army in 1920 were suddenly put into a concentration camp on the suspicion that you can't trust Jews, that Jews are simply going to help uh, the Bolsheviks. But as I said, for all the problems they suffered, Jews could vote. They had civil liberties, relatively speaking. And they care deeply about politics. The greatest, and this is an election poster uh, saying Jews vote for list number 11. It was probably an Aguda poster, but it shows that Jews took elections very seriously. The greatest success of Jewish political party so it was not in electoral politics. They had no hope of ever getting real power. But in that all the Jewish parties had a vision and a total way of life that they offered their followers. Schools, youth groups, orphanages, health care, newspapers. A political party was a way of life for many people, where you met your spouse, where you, where, where you had all your friends. It was your world. And so we have an interactive display featuring the Jewish deputies in the same, the Polish parliament. And we have a timeline that marks the key events of the period. You could push on the names of certain Jewish deputies, and you could hear, uh, uh, you, you could see the words of some of their major speeches. And here are some of the uh, Jewish delegates to uh, the Polish saying. <coughs> there were three major Jewish political trends, and we show them in deliberate order. First, Zionism the most popular political movement in the first period of Polish independence, and then the religious Aguda, whose fortunes rose under Pilsudski between 1926 and 1935, and then finally the Bund, which became the strongest Jewish party after 1935, and we also show the assimilationists, the focus, and the communists. We show posters <coughs> And voters can uh, press on those posters and learn more about the political party that they uh, represent. In the exhibit about Zionism, this image of the sun reminds us that of all the political movements in Polish Jewry, Zionism was the one that could appeal to the widest variety of Jews, religious Jews, secular Jews, leftists, rightists. There was even a Yiddish Zionist party called the Left. Uh, uh, and in addition, we have a film about Jabotinsky. We point out the leader of the revisionists. We uh, show the great achievements of Polish Zionism, the Torbett schools, Hebrew schools, and the fact that uh, 
Poma Zionism inspired the youth movements, Hashomer Hatzair, Dror, and because of Polish Zionism, 100,000 Polish Jews went to Palestine in those interwar years. And without them, the issue probably might not have succeeded in creating the state of Israel. After Zionism, we show the Agudas Yisroel, the religious party and its leaders, the Ger Rebbe, Chaim Oizer Grzynski of Vilna, <coughs> Meyer Shapiro, who established the Daf Yomi, a daily Talmud study, which exists to this day, and organized the Lublin Yeshiva, which, which was dedicated in 1930. The platform and the achievements of the Aguda are presented in a film, and we also use such events as the dedication of the Yeshiva, the Beis Yankov schools for girls, new summer camps, and new newspapers to show how the Aguda was not just a stick in the mud conservative party, it adapted to new challenges. Now we come to the book. The Bund became the strongest party in Polish Jewry between 1935 and 1939. To show you how strong the Bund became in the local elections of 1938, which were more representative than national elections, of the 20 Jewish delegates who were elected to the Warsaw City Council, 18 came from the Bund. And you had the same results in Lodz and in Vilna. It wasn't because the Jews had suddenly become Marxists. There was a saying at that time, uh, the Jews voted for the Bund on their way to Mincha, on their way to afternoon praise. What it did show, though, was that in a period of rising Polish anti-Semitism, the Bund emerged as the one party that was willing to fight for the Jews' right to stay in Poland as self-respecting citizens. Here we see the uh, student disturbances where Polish students demanded ghetto benches and terrible violence broke out in uh, the universities as Polish students demanded either the expulsion of Jewish students or that they sit in separate parts of the classroom, which students, Jewish students refused to do. And this sign says, a day without Jews, we demand a formal ghetto, we demand an administrative ghetto in front of the university. 1936, many pogroms break out in Poland. This is a pogrom in Minsk Mazowiecki, just 30 miles from uh, central Warsaw, where the entire Jewish population uh, runs for shelter in the capital city. And it was in this period of concern that the Bund came out fighting. And uh, the Bund's major election poster, which the visitor can explore and interactively, is Dalton will get Latin, Dalton is unser Land. Our land is where we live. The Bund was against Zionism, it was against the Aguda, it was against the communists. It said Poland is our homeland. Vote for a democratic republic and for full political and national rights. Now, this is the leader of the Bund, Henrik Ehrlich, who was murdered by Stalin. Uh, in World War II, and he's addressing a Bundes demonstration in the late 1930s. At the end of the politics timeline, there's an interactive presentation on Jews who supported the Communist Party. And we did this with some hesitancy, with some reluctance, because one of the first things you hear from anti-Semites in Poland is Zida Kamuna, the Jews for communists. And the fact is that while many communists were Jews, 30% of the Polish Communist Party, very few Jews were communists. In the 1928 same elections, which gives us kind of the fairest reflection of, of, of a Jewish sentiment about communism, uh, only about 5% of the Jews voted for communist front organizations. So we show this very fraught and very complicated subject. And now we come to culture. Culture in the interwar period is a story of paradoxes. Yiddish literature and the Yiddish theater flourish even though Yiddish was in retreat on the Jewish street. Despite growing anti-Semitism and despite the collapse of traditional assimilationism, more Jews than ever spoke Polish and not Yiddish as their first language while remaining proudly Jewish. But the story of Jewish culture in interwar Poland was not a zero-sum game 
where one language triumphed at the expense of another. As Professor Hanusz Meruk reminds us, Polish Jewry developed a culture that was polylingual, a rich interplay of Yiddish, Polish, and Hebrew. Even as Jews spoke Polish, they went to the Yiddish theater and they studied Hebrew. Now, a key component of the culture exhibit is the so-called newspaper wall. The newspaper wall shows the many, many, many daily and weekly Jewish newspapers that came out in Yiddish and Polish. And visitors can explore two of them in depth in interactive stations. That is the Yiddish Daily Heint and the Polish language Jewish Daily Maschegnu. And we encourage the visitor to ask why Polish-speaking Jews felt that they needed their own daily newspapers. Why couldn't they read the Polish equivalent of the New York Times or the San Francisco Chronicle? And this is a very important issue, and this is something that we encourage the visitor to explore. We also encourage the visitor to explore what Catherine Stefan has called Jewish Polonitet, Jewish Polishness, the self-affirming Jewish culture in the Polish language that was becoming more and more important in the 1930s. And this Polish language Jewish press, especially Nas Czeglon, became increasingly popular. Here they're sponsoring a Miss Judea contest for the most of a beautiful Jewish woman in Poland. And the lucky winner is Pani Zofia Oldakówna. And here we see uh, a, a journal called Eva, a weekly journal put out by Paulina Oppenschlag, the wife of the publisher of Nas Czeglon. Eva was a woman's journal. It was a journal aimed at largely middle-class Jewish women, and it discussed issues relating to uh, women, child rape, child rearing, sexuality, and so on. And we then show some major cultural spaces. Vilna, the capital of Yiddish land, this imaginary country of millions of Yiddish speakers around the world, but if it had one capital, it was Vilna. As Nochem Schiff said, Peretz may have written in Warsaw, but he was read in Vilna. <laughs> and the Vilna exhibit focuses on two themes. One is Jung Vilna, the young poets, Sutzkever, Grave, Kaczerginski, and others. And the other is the YIVO, the Yiddish Scientific Institute, which encouraged Jews to zamel, to collect, to collect folklore and history and documents, to build their own archives, because a people without a territory and without a state, if they don't build their archives, and if they don't write their history, then others, their enemies, will do it for them. And it's no accident that the Oynik Shabbos Archive in the Warsaw Ghetto, organized by Manuel Ringelblum, was led by people who had been on the EVO executive board. Max Weinreich, the director of the EVO, began an ambitious project to study Jewish youth. In the 1930s, he visited the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. He wanted to find out how African Americans give their young people the psychological wherewithal to defend themselves against American racism, because Jews, young Jews in Poland were feeling that same pariah status. And so he encouraged a new level of Zamlin. He encouraged Polish Jewish youth all over the country to write their autobiographies. The Evo collected 600 of these autobiographies, and we used them throughout the whole exhibit. We used quotes from these autobiographies to underscore what Polish Jewish youth were thinking. We then go to Tlamatska 13, the Writers Club in uh, Warsaw, the Yiddish Writers Club, where all the writers and journalists would get together, where they would kibitz, where they would play with Fifi the Cat, where they would dance uh, to uh, uh, the uh, latest jazz tunes. And one thing was missing from Tomaska 13, Peretz. Yitzchak Leibush Peretz, the great Yiddish writer, was, was dead. And they missed the fact that only he could have really brought them together. And here's a cartoon. It shows the writers in Tlamatska 13 dancing, playing records, Fifi the cat, of course. And then the great dead Yiddish writers who've already passed on. And there's uh, parrots, and he's peeking down from heaven. 
and Shalom Aleichem is holding him by the feet and trying to keep him from falling down. And uh, Parrot says, Voshidos Faramin Literatur, what kind of literature is this? And Shalom Aleichem says, no, this is real Yiddish culture. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a sarcastic uh, comment on the Tomatsky 13, but it was a very, very popular place. And here we have some of the Jewish writers who came to Tlamovsky in the early 20s, uh, I.J. Singer, Yuri Steve Greenberg, uh, per, uh, Paris Marquez, uh, Zelig uh, Segalovich. There's a telephone where visitors can hear lively accounts of what's going on. Uh, they can hear snippets of memoirs and so on. There's a wonderful part of the exhibit where you can press onto a Yiddish text and a translation automatically appears and then the words rearrange themselves into a likeness of the author. For the world of Polish speaking Jews we use the Cafe Zienianska in Warsaw where the Polish literary and artistic elite would gather, jazz musicians, cabaret wits, playwrights and artists, singers, Jewish composers and band leaders like Gold and uh, Petr Gorski. The regulars included uh, Tuvin, Swaninski, Lechon, and uh, we show the uh, tragic <coughs> position of some of these Yiddish, some of these Jewish poets who wrote in the Polish language and who were often rejected by Polish nationalists because of their Jewish origin. Interwar Jewish Poland also saw a vibrant Yiddish theater, vibrant uh, jazz bands like the Gold Petrburski Band. Uh, this is the actor Paula Walter playing uh, in the great production of the Dibu, done by the Vilna Truppe in 1920. Uh, uh, this is the film studio of Leo Forbert, who produced many films in Yiddish and Polish in uh, the 1930s. There's also uh, popular culture. This is the strong man, Zisha Breitbart, who could bend anything, who could break out of any cage, who could bend iron, and he died of tetanus after a blood infection and his funeral attracted tens of thousands of uh, Jews. There's an art salon where Jewish artists like Yankiv Adler uh, and Henry Bear, Bear Levy are exhibited. This is, Alter, this is Adler's painting, the daughter of the Baal Shem Tov. And then upstairs, <coughs> how much do they have on time? And then we go upstairs. We've gone through politics and culture, and now upstairs, daily life. And the way we decided to do daily life is to focus on a very fascinating organization in interwar Poland called Lankentnisch, or Kryasnostro. The Poles came together having lived under different rulers for over a hundred years, and to create a sense of shared Polishness among Poles who lived in different parts of the country, the Poles founded a Kajasnowska Society, tourism, studying uh, architectural landmarks to you know, reinforce the sense of being Polish. And Jews weren't accepted into this society. In 1931, Jews founded their own society called Lankentnisch, hike, kayak, canoe, ski, visit museums, hike across every bit of the Polish land to remind you and the Poles that this is your land as well as theirs. And Lankentnisch became a very popular movement. They had a monthly journal called Lankentnisch Krasnowska. It was in Polish and in Yiddish. Each month would have a different theme like kayaking or canoeing. And so what we do is we show different towns in this exhibit to illustrate different issues of Polish Jewish life. The negatives of the Jewish photographer in the shtetl of Shuchin survived, and we use these negatives to show 
Jewish kids being photographed for their birthday. We show the marketplace in uh, Shuchin. We show Jewish girls dressing up in peasant costumes. We use Bobov to talk about Hasidism, and this is the wedding of the daughter of the Bubba Rebbe in 1931. And Hasidim are mounted on horses and are dressed like Cossacks, and they ride to the railroad station to welcome the, the uh, groom, and it's a real uh, production. Uh, we use the town of Kazimish Dolny on the Vistula to talk about the Yiddish writers and poets who would relax there in uh, the summertime. We use the town of Novarodok, Nova Grudek, to talk about one of the most amazing achievements of interwar Polish Jewry. Its ability to organize, its ability to create organizations like TOS uh, to uh, uh, advance the public health of Polish Jews, to teach about hygiene, proper diet, and so on. And this is a Toz poster. Uh, guard, your, guard your health. Help the Toz. And it shows a sickly old Jew being led up the stairs by a buff young Jew uh, who is going to teach him that he has to work out and he has to get, get a six pack and get some abs and uh, so on and so forth. And what we do is that in these different towns, many Jews from America would go back and take home movies. And there's an exhibit of some of these home movies now in San Francisco. And so we use the home movies to talk about a different theme. We also use uh, uh, the image of, of, of Rudolf Schultz for Dorhovich, uh, Kamaitis, uh, Rabbi Kamaitis for Katowice, which was an example of a formerly German-speaking town that was now part of Poland. The last part of the exhibit, I'm going to wrap this up, maybe cut it a little bit short, is childhood. Children's toys, children's rhymes, growing up, the courtyards uh, of, of Polish cities where kids would play their games. We have a hopscotch diagram, chalk in the floor, which invites <coughs> visitors to play. And we have the sound of children chanting Yiddish rhymes. We also talk about schooling. And in addition to Polish schools, about 40% of Jewish children went to Yiddish or to Hebrew schools or to Jewish religious schools. Karbut for the Zionists, Sisho for the secular Yiddishists, the Mora uh, for the Aguda. And we have interactive desks where you could study uh, each kind of school. This is an interactive desk for the Hebrew schools where the kids in Karbut were taught how to speak very good Hebrew. And if you press the books, if you open up the exhibits, you can learn quite a lot about that. This is the great teacher and educator, Janusz Korczak, who had a weekly uh, issue in Nash Sheglon called Malik Sheglon for Jewish kids. He invited Jewish kids to put out this part of the newspaper. And we talk about the health organizations, the TOS, and then the youth movements. The Hashomer Hatzair, the home away from home. These were the movements that produced Mordechai Ali Levich, Abba Kovner, Yitzhak Zuckerman, some of the leaders of the ghetto uh, uprisings. And of course, uh, the heights and the outings. And notice, you know, these kids are, they may have problems, but they're happy on that day. They're together, they're in a family, and they feel good about themselves. And so, anyway, that's just a little introduction to what the exhibit was all about. Thank you. Communism and anti-Semitism. Uh, communism was also on the rise in interwar, and so the question is, um, you kind of touched on it, but it still wasn't clear to me whether communism found a better home with the Jews than with the the Polish people. Look, one of the reasons we we had a hard time with communism in this is that one because you know the first thing out of the mouths of Poles who will look for any excuse to say nasty things about Jews is Judah Kamuna, the Jews are communists. 
And indeed, there was a real problem in the post-war gallery because, because it was so dangerous for Jews, especially in small towns in 45, 46, 47, you know, do, do you say that Jews after the war look to the new communist government for protection? It was absolutely true, but do you say that? <laughs> so the issue of communism is fraught. Arguments against dealing with communism were that communism is not a Jewish movement. Most Polish communists were not Jewish. Communism had supporters in the Silesian coal mines. It had supporters in the Ukrainian and Belarusian peasants. <coughs> and communism was not a distinctly Jewish movement. And the uh, real thing about communism is not how many Jews supported it, but how few Jews supported it. Because all you had to do was look across the border at the Soviet Union, Jewish generals, Jewish admirals, Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish ministers. The universities were open to Jews, at least until the end of the 30s. And you would think so many Polish Jews would embrace the model of the Soviet Union. Here, there's no discrimination. Here, we're free. And so what's interesting is that when you had a real test of Jewish opinion, only about 5% actually voted for organizations that could express support of communism. That was the 1928 election. By the end of the 30s, the purge trials, the shooting of the Jewish leadership of Bira and finally in 1938, Stalin dissolved the Polish Communist Party, said it was infested by Trotskyism. And so uh, this whole Jewish romance of communism is highly exaggerated. Uh, communism is not that popular. However, we had to deal with it. We couldn't just ignore it or sweep it under the rug. And Jews were 10% of the population. They were about 30% of the communist population. Another movement was anti-Semitism. You touched on that a little bit. Yeah. But we've heard, you know, that in Poland, anti-Semitism really found a home. It also found a home in Germany, obviously. Yeah. But why, why would it have found a home in Poland, particularly? Well, it, again, the theme of Polish anti-Semitism is very, very common. On the one, it's a, on the one hand, on the other hand. On the one hand, there was anti-Semitism in Poland. The church was an important source of anti-Semitism. Another source of anti-Semitism was the national movement that said that a nation that doesn't have its own middle class can't be a real nation, and the Jews are our middle class, and they're occupying us. Another source of anti-Semitism was the accusation that the Jews sided with Poland's enemies after 1918, the Bolsheviks, the Lithuanians, the Germans, so that the Jews were an alien element. And on the other hand, Polish anti-Semitism ran into limits which German anti-Semitism didn't face. For example, there was the teaching of the Catholic Church that condemned racist anti-Semitism. Now, that didn't mean the Jewish converts were not always being reminded of their origin. But it did mean that officially, the government could not go down the line of the road of racial anti-Semitism. And that's why Poland never seriously considered passing a version of the Nuremberg Law. And there were all these exceptions. The Foreign Minister, Josef Beck, uh, in his correspondence, you know, uh, he advocated all kinds of administrative measures to make life hard for Jews to encourage them to emigrate. But he had many close Jewish friends in his personal circle. I mean, this is something you wouldn't see from a Gary or a Goebbels. So in other words, it was always a little bit more complicated. And uh, today, in my mind, the only anti-Semitism that really matters and that you should be really afraid of is the anti-Semitism that masquerades as anti-Zionism. That's dangerous anti-Semitism. And you see that in Western Europe. You don't really see that much of it in Poland. You have little remnants of the old Catholic anti-Semitism, <coughs> the old folk anti-Semitism, Poland is kind of at a psychological crossroads. On the one hand, the European Union and 
and being a modern Western country. On the other hand, the sense that it was the Catholic Church that kept us together as a people, that made us special, that made us who, who, who we are. Some Poles look at Quebec and Ireland, formerly Catholic countries, now becoming rapidly secular. I say, we don't want that for ourselves. And all these arguments about national identity, the image of you know the Jew comes into it somehow. But I can say without any reservation that if you want to measure anti-Semitism today, Poland is one of the better countries in the world, especially in comparison with Britain, Ireland, France, Sweden, and uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. I have a question. You said that no matter where the Jews are, Eventually, their roots all go to the that they are from Poland. Well, probably, if they're Ashkenazi Jews, yeah. the probabilities are that their ancestors came from the lands of the old Polish Commonwealth. How did they end up in Poland? Well, you know, there's a big argument about that, uh, and there are people who say, you know, there are some people who say, well, the Khazars came from the east. And then they converted all these Slavic peasants, and then somehow these Slavic peasants started speaking Yiddish. Except that the proof that they were Slavic rather than Germans was that Yiddish developed a different word order than German. It was a Slavic rather than a German word order. Now, Shoal Stomper, scholar of Hebrew University, has, I think, really uh, uh, hit back against that thesis and has reaffirmed the basic thesis that most of the Polish Jews immigrated to Poland from Bohemia, from, from the German lands. Uh, there, of course, they met indigenous Jews, but just as the Spanish Jews assimilated the uh, Greek and Turkish Jews when they settled in the Eastern Mediterranean after the expulsion, I think these Yiddish-speaking Jews assimilated the native Jews. And so most Polish Jews came from this migration from Western Europe. Now, the, some demographers say that can't be because you can't have millions of people coming from such a tiny uh, original group. And an, a one answer is yes, that, that, that can be. If you look at Quebec, there were only a, uh, maybe 10,000 original French settlers, and that number grew to 60,000, and now you have 5 million. Uh, so it was possible, given the fact that the Jewish mortality rate was a lot lower, uh, that Jews had a social safety net in their communal structure, which non-Jews didn't have as much, and the Jewish population tended to grow very quickly. If I heard you correctly, you said that by 1647, I think, the Ashkenazi uh, counted for about fifty percent of the Jews in about sixty. No, made up the other no, 60, 50 percent of the Jews in the world. Of the world Jewry in sixteen fifty, Ashkenazi was fifty percent. By nineteen hundred, it was ninety percent. Sam, yeah. uh, Barbara Christian Black Gimblet has said that this museum has the power to be an agent of transformation. Yeah. And, and how does she mean that? What do you think? Well, I think in, in the way that I mentioned in, in my talk today. One, uh, it reminds Poles of what their country used to be. Uh, it shows Jews not as stereotypes, but as real people. Uh, Perhaps the first time someone goes through the museum, they might not feel that. But over time, I think the Poles will certainly get a sense of this enormous Jewish presence in their land. At least I hope that's the case. Uh, one thing that always surprised me was the extent to which Polish scholars used to go out of their way to pretend that Jews never lived in their country. And when I was writing my book on Emanuel Ringelblum, in 1938, the mm -hmm. Polish historical journal, Fartanwik Historyczny, had a special issue, 20 years of historiography in the independent Polish state. 
and a professor named Ingla wrote a chapter on urban history and independent Poland. Well, urban history, the, half the urban population in Poland had been Jewish. And he writes one short sentence, may, maybe two. Jews, all, Jews like Schipper, Balaban, Mahler, and others also deal with this topic. <laughs> This is in 1938, but under communism, you have the same thing. So now, with this museum, and with the fact that you have serious Jewish scholarship in major Polish universities, Marcin Wojcicki and Agnieszka Jagodzinska and Monika Karpowska and Eugenia Prokopowna-Janiec and so on, now that you have serious Jewish periodicals, a periodical like Midrash is one of the best monthly Jewish monthlies coming out in the world. Once you have that, hopefully Poles will see what the Jews meant to them, to their country. By the same token, if these study programs to Poland work, which I hope they do and I'm sure that they will, then American, young American Jews are going to understand where they come from. And hopefully, the prediction of Max Weinreich will someday come true. Max Weinreich had been the head of the evil. And he came to the United States in 1940. Everybody's saying Yiddish is dying, but what use do we have for the evil? Blah, blah. And Max Weinreich said, I don't know when it's going to happen 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. But the Jews in this country someday are going to ask, who are we really? Where do we come from? Where does our culture really come from? And then they're going to come back to us. And what this museum in Warsaw offers non-Polish Jews is a treasure trove of answers and a treasure trove of questions that they can ask about themselves. Uh, to really develop in themselves a real sense of the Jews as a people. Uh, not, you know, members of a Chavura on the one hand, although I have nothing against Chavura, I think it's great. Not as quote unquote uh, soldiers in a Zionist army, which is a tired stereotype that we don't hear. But as a people that lived on the Polish lands for a thousand years and produced art, produced poetry, uh, uh, produced organizations that took care of the poor, that uh, took care of children, uh, a record that shows a people that was not only creative, but very proud. I think this could be a source of real inspiration. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Anti-Semitism is a horrible thing. It, it is. I'm Syrian, so I'm telling you my feeling. Mm -hmm. But um, I also try to find, do we understand the root causes for it? Why does it exist? Well, I mean, that could, that could fill a whole library. <laughs> yes. I mean, let's put it this way. It's, it, it, it's hard to know. The thing about anti-Semitism is that it's a, if, if you're a rich man and you hate Jews, you hate them because they're poor. If you're poor, you hate Jews because they're bankers. If you're a communist, you hate Jews because they're fat cat capitalists. If you're a fat cat capitalist, you hate Jews because they're socialists. If you're a nationalistic German or Pole in the 1930s, you say, you know what, we hate you Jews because you're ruthless cosmopolitans. Get out of our face. Let us build our own nation state. Go to Palestine. We won't hate you so much. Now people say, we hate nation states. We're all cosmopolitans. So if you Jews only got out of Israel, then we wouldn't hate you so much. So anti-Semitism is basically really about what you hate and you make it into a Jewish thing. So therefore, that, that could never, you could never really fight that. But there's something else which I think contributes to it, that the Jews are the only people that said go to hell to two of the major world religions. That is, they rejected Jesus, which many Christians had trouble with. And then they rejected the prophet. You know, the Quran, full of these treacherous Jewish tribes that tried to that spit on the prophet. 
So you have two of the major world religions, and you have these stiff-necked Jews saying, we don't need you. We're better than you are. So maybe there's something there. But uh, there's one thing I know for sure. Uh, when Jews say, if we only change our behavior, if we only stop doing X, Y, and Z, then anti-Semitism will disappear, that ain't going to happen. That's not going to happen. You had uh, attacks on Israel before the 67 war, and uh, while reasonable people can differ about a two-state solution, I think in theory it's a wonderful thing, in theory. Uh, I do know that if Israel were to withdraw to every inch of the 67 borders, very little would actually change in terms of its legitimacy. Very well done. We have time for one more question. I'm sorry, this is no okay. I'm sorry, it's this gentleman. Okay. And then uh, you can speak to Sam. I wonder if you uh, cover the uh, rise of uh, Jewish learning for Jews in Poland in the interwar years. Uh, yeah. For instance, an example, uh, the Stiebel book publishing houses in Warsaw. Yeah, absolutely. I read their books in Israel in the 1960s. Yeah. Um, uh, in Vilna, particularly, well, we have a center of Jewish learners. Yeah. An example, uh, Shmuel Dubnov. We, yeah. we, we have a whole exhibit about Vilna. Okay. And, uh, and we have, uh, we have in the, we, we, we have it. The best answer to your question in terms of publishers, you know, had, had, had I another half an hour, I could have talked about the youth movements. One thing we do with the youth movements is we look at their libraries. And so each youth movement, Hashomer, Sukkum, so on, they, 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 they had a bookshelf. And you could press on the book and you could see what kids were reading and who published it. And we have Boris Kletzkin and we have Stiebel and we have Kulturlieb and we have all the big publishing houses. And we also have Jewish publishing in the 19th century now, because Warsaw becomes a big Jewish center uh, in part because of the publishing houses, like that the Ezer. So thank you, Sam. Thank you so much.